You're listening to The World at Eight with Lynn Mozart. <laughs> Nationalist News. Highlights of the news today, Friday the 25th of May. Sikh Labour councillor operates a slumlord in Glasgow. Libyan diplomat lays wreath for Yvonne Fletcher. Labour councillors have the worst attendance record. Euro News with Nick Griffin, MEP from Strasbourg. Amnesty criticises Australian government over treatment of Aborigines. Spanish Bank suspends trading due to fears of bailout. U.S. Senators trump Pakistan authorities. Race riots in Tel Aviv. UK News. Labour councillor Sohan Singh has been operating as an illegal landlord nearly a year before his election triumph in Glasgow. The businessman and Labour councillor bought 28 flats in Glasgow for just a pound, and you've guessed it, from the Glasgow City Council. The flats were not registered as having tenants up to his run into the election and were not registered with the Glasgow City Council. Landlord registration is a requirement of the Antisocial Behaviour Scotland Act 2004 and failure to do so carries a maximum penalty of £50,000. With 28 flats, he would have to be registered as a professional landlord, subjecting him to fit and proper person tests, health, safety and fire inspections. Even though Mr Singh only registered after being pursued, no retrospective action can be taken against him. However, he was jailed in 1999 for a duty-free tax scam. One World Date writer commented, No wonder Labour snapped him up. With a track record like that, he's a perfect candidate for a perfectly corrupt party. The interim Prime Minister of Libya, Abdurahim El Kaib, has placed a wreath on the spot where PC Yvonne Fletcher was murdered by Muslim terrorists outside the Iranian embassy in London. PC Yvonne Fletcher was shot dead in April of 1984 whilst on duty outside the embassy. A Labour councillor has said he may step down from the council for having the worst attendance record. The whole of the Labour Party have only attended 80% of all council meetings one survey had discovered. Why the hell do people vote for Labour when they don't attend the meetings that they are elected for, one spokesperson commented. The councillor with the worst attendance record is Simon Slater, who managed to attend just 18 of the 34 meetings he was supposed to attend. Disgraceful is what one reporter commented. Slater commented that the Green Party never turn up and said he was surprised that they had attended more than him. There now follows the European news from the Belly of the Beast and Nick Griffin, MEP. This dispatch comes from the Beast Strasbourg Belly, where the out-of-touch Europhile elite has spent another pleasant week happily rearranging their deck chairs. In several earlier stages of the long shipwreck that is the Euro single currency, there was a palpable sense of panic in the hemicycle, which is the peculiar Eurospeak term for the parliamentary chamber. But the fog of denial and self-deception is now so thick and all-pervasive that an eerie calm prevails. No one mentions the fact that the deck beneath our feet is listing at a crazier angle every day. To mix the metaphor, no one mentions the currency crisis elephant or the debt dinosaur who are both rampaging around the room. It's an omission which wouldn't be sensible under any circumstances, but it's positively perverse when they both have a form of highly contagious projectile dysentery. But no, there we were, voting to order the Russians to stop being nasty to George Soros puppets who've been caught with their expensively manicured fingers in the till in Ukraine. Could there be any greater irony than a gaggle of faceless, third-rate nobodies elected on anonymous party list tickets in a contest where nearly two-thirds of voters couldn't even bother to participate, ignoring the fact that their precious project is catastrophically bankrupt while wasting their time tut-tutting at the very successful leader of one of the richest and most powerful nations in world history. And President Putin in Russia itself, whatever his faults, unlike us all, he surely has them, at least stood and won by a large majority under his own name and on a ticket and record that everyone understood. By contrast, most of the minority of Brits who still bother to vote do so on the basis of what their chosen parties claimed to stand for 50 years ago. And let's face it, out of some 70 British MEPs, 99% of the British public will be hard-pressed to name anyone except, thanks to the BBC, Nigel Farage, me, and, if they read the Telegraph, perhaps the Tories' Daniel Hannan. The rest wouldn't even be noticed as missing if the SS Euro broke up and sank without trace 
taking all hands with it, tomorrow morning. Sadly, and for all the chaos and crisis engulfing the euro, that isn't on the cards for a while longer yet. Even as the single currency model of ever closer union disintegrates in acrimony, the Europhiles are regrouping to push on towards the same totally undemocratic aim through other means, constitutional reform, using taxpayers' money to brainwash schoolchildren, and hijacking good causes to promote a cancerous anti-culture of creeping federalism and political correctness. Yesterday, for example, on top of motions for an EU raw materials tax, condemnations of alleged homophobia in Eastern Europe, and the inevitable dose of climate change and carbon hysteria, we were voting on a report headed Equal Pay for Male and Female Workers Doing the Same Jobs. Now I happen to think that's a very fair, just and sensible aim. But as is so often the case, the PC devil is in the detail, with the left using it all as an excuse for yet another bout of vicious, nation-wrecking, anti-male social engineering, and the mainstream right being too stupid or cowardly to stand up to them. As with the report and block of votes last month on women and climate change, some of the rhetoric is so absurd that it borders on self-parody. But sadly, it's not a laughing matter, because the anti-male, anti-family, anti-human hatred that lies beneath is not a victimless crime. It feeds into the cruelty to so many fathers and grandparents, driven to despair by an endless, expensive, losing struggle to see their little ones, and the scandal of loving families torn apart by state-sanctioned baby kidnap and institutionalised child abuse by common-purpose graduates and anti-family neo-Marxists in the social services. You know, sometimes the sheer weight of all their poisonous nonsense gets even me down a bit. So it was wonderful last week to spend three days and nights with Jackie on a tidy little boat, albeit a hideous orange colour on the outside, on the Norfolk Broads. Looking at the vast number of boats, still in the big higher marinas, I hesitate to recommend going in the holiday season, when the rivers and broads themselves must resemble a sort of watery Friday afternoon M25. If you do go then, take a tip from me and spend a bit extra to hire a rowing dinghy to tow behind you, because then you won't have to stop cruising in the early afternoon to find a decent mooring within walking distance of one of the fantastic pubs, so you can enjoy a well-deserved pint or three of Adnams or Woodford's. The Fur and Feathers at Wood Bathwick, which is Woodford's Brewery Tap Pub, is a real ale pilgrimage that has to be undertaken if you're anywhere near the area. With a dinghy, you simply drop your mud anchor over the side of your hire boat and then row yourself ashore past all the folk who don't know the score and have to queue up in the vain hope of getting a mooring at one of the quays, or staiths as they're known in every part of eastern England once settled by the Vikings, including, of course, Norfolk. But out of season, not only are the boats really quite cheap compared to, say, a couple of nights bed and breakfast somewhere else, but there are also no overcrowding worries. You get to moor where you like, when you like, and to chuck along wide rivers and expanses of open water, almost empty, except for the swallows and terns swooping overhead, and herons standing motionless as they wait in the reeds for an, un for an unwary meal. Those great big East Anglian skies arch over you, and even if it does rain a bit, the spectacular Turneresque clouds in the vast vault of our English heaven make up for it. And when the sun comes out, wow! But don't take my word for it. Give the bucket shop flights and vulgarity of the Costa del Vomit a miss, and explore this unique jewel in the crown of our green and pleasant land. The Norfolk Broads are waiting for you. Go and enjoy what we're fighting to preserve, because after all, it's your England. World News Amnesty International has spoken out about the problems facing the Aborigines in Australia. Amnesty has picked up the cudgels on behalf of the Aborigines, who actually are the indigenous people of Australia, and have strongly criticised the treatment of the Aborigines by the Australian government. One British National Party spokesperson commented, It may be true, but could you come to Britain and say that? Or is it all quiet when the shoe is on the other foot? The Spanish bank, Bankia, suspended its shares amidst a bailout request. It has been reported by Professor Santiago Cabo Valverde, University of Granada, Bankia had huge exposure to real estate and bad loans. Trading was suspended ahead of a planned board meeting this afternoon to reformulate its accounts for 2011. The bank is reported to be due to ask the government for a bailout of more than 15 billion euros. That is 19 billion dollars, or 12 billion pounds. This bank was created in 2010 from the merger of seven struggling regional savings banks. It holds 32 billion euros in distressed property assets. 
Does this sound depressingly familiar? Senators in the United States have hit back at the Pakistani authorities for jailing a doctor who helped the CIA in the capture and killing of the world's most wanted man, Osama bin Laden. Bin Laden was killed by a special operations team in Pakistan with help from this doctor who had been informing the CIA. The Pakistani government has sentenced this gentleman to over 30 years in jail. So in retaliation, the US government senators cut its aid to Pakistan. The aid cut is $1 million for every year of the doctor's sentence. The aid to Pakistan once stood at a staggering 33 million US dollars. A World Date reporter commented, Good, the first cut is the deepest. We Brits would have just given them more. A race riot is reported to have started in the Israeli capital, Tel Aviv. Israeli police fought off African asylum seekers who the police were trying to remove from Israeli soil. It is reported that 60,000 Africans had entered Israel in the last few years. One spokesperson said it would appear that Israel is paying the price for the multicultural edict it has spread through the world. The chickens have come home to roost. Thought for the day. This is just a short soundbite for today. Apparently, John Barnes, former black England footballer, not known for their brain power, footballers that is, has said, and I quote, passive racism is inherent in all of us, true, but it is caused by quote, preconceived ideas planted by books and films, unquote. Now I see a book burning coming here, my friends. Agatha Christie and Kipling made the British passive racists. Oh dear, oh dear. The only point he has made that is true is that during the good old days in Blighty, up to the 1950s, it was very rare to see a black face. Kipling was more on the Indian subcontinent, of course, but his knowledge of the Indian people and human nature was extraordinary. As for good old Agatha, she made the odd Levantine gentleman into something mysterious and interesting, certainly not a figure just about to inflict the terrors of a jihad on an unsuspecting population. I remember from my excursions into Kew Gardens when a toddler the sight of a group of very colourful Indian ladies having a picnic. It wasn't a usual sight and it was admired, not vilified. The only single effect that massive and continuing immigration has on any country is either a blunting of national pride or an emergence of self-survival. Barnes wants to change the national curriculum so that children are taught race is only a concept. Very impressive, John, however very untrue. Race is what defines us. People can look at our faces and skin and know, more or less, what race we come from. It is necessary. It is similar to the tale of the Tower of Babel. Man became too ambitious. They all spoke the same language and their king, Nimrod, decided to build a tower that would reach up to heaven itself. Nearing the finish of his wish, God spoke and the tower toppled, and all the men working on it suddenly spoke differing languages. It was a lesson from the Almighty not to overreach ourselves, but also to identify each other from different backgrounds. Our children are being taught enough rubbish in schools now. The thing we have to do is to install the love of England and their own culture in our children. There is a reason why people who are different colours come from different lands in a child's eyes. It doesn't and shouldn't denigrate any child. You must be proud of what and who you are. Comics in the 80s made wonderful jokes about everybody. Mother-in-laws, female drivers, blacks, Asians, Scots, Irish, Jews, you name it. I loved Chalky, Jim Davison's West Indian alter ego to death. Jim made him lovable and very, very funny. Humour and understanding are what is needed here, and a total ban on any future immigration, whether that is footballers or not, and certainly people like Barnes who get publicity from talking bleeps. And finally, there is a Nessie in Alaska. Yes, and this time there is a film of the so-called Loch Ness Monster. It has a horse-like head at the end of a long neck with big eyes and humps on its back. It undulates like a sea serpent. Remarkable footage has been shot by a fisherman in Bristol Bay of this huge, slithery creature. They are large animals swimming up and down and probably propelling themselves by their tails. It's clearly not a whale and not a seal, said scientist Paul Leblond after viewing the video which premiered on this week's edition of Discovery Channel's Alaskan Monster Hunt. That looks a lot like a Cadborosaurus, said Leblond, former head of the Department of Earth and Ocean Sciences at the University of British Columbia. This World at Eight presenter says, I always did believe in monsters, but I hope we humans leave them alone and not try to capture them. We must learn to respect these serpents or lizards and their habitat. You have been listening to the World at Eight. I am Lynn Mozart, and I and the team at Radio Britain Wish you all a very happy and safe weekend.